Well, the world of work today is more interconnected, 24-7, always on, very dynamic, but very demanding on employees. And so it can be high stress. We know that people are spending more hours at work than they used to. Stress levels are relatively high. And so it's really incumbent on managers and HR professionals to create order and a sense of calm and a sense of clarity and a sense of purpose so that in this always-on, hyper-connected work environment, people feel that they know what they're responsible for, they know where to spend their time, and they don't feel overwhelmed by stress and activity and potentially um, you know, repercussions that they're not aware of. So um, I would say the world of work today, and it's also very technology driven, there's almost no jobs left that don't have a technology augmented nature to them, sales, marketing, finance, manufacturing, production, logistics, analytics, all of those jobs have new tools. And so people, employees of all levels have to learn how to use technology, um, learn to be comfortable with technology, and be comfortable with the fact that maybe the way you used to do things two years ago is going to change, uh, but you're still going to need, be needed at work in a new, in a new environment. So um, all of those things, you know, kind of characterize the changes of work. And then the final thing I would mention is <clears throat> because of the nature of the interconnectivity of people at work, and the tools we have to communicate with each other, we're working in small teams now that are cross-functional. So it's much more common for people in, say, in sales to work with other salespeople or other functional people on a project as opposed to only go to their manager to get help. So, we're, so it's a much more empowered environment, um, you're, you know, requiring people to create good communications, good networks, uh, good relationships, to create followership, um, get to know people better. So even though we have a lot of technology, the human connections, the physical connections, the relationships you have with people now are maybe even more important than they've been you know, in a long time. Well, I think ideally, if, if HR people really think about this new world of work, we should be the architects trying to change the HR practices, the people practices, to adapt to the way work gets done today. And so that's really a job of focusing on productivity. How does work get done? How does a salesperson do their job? How does a customer service agent do their job? And what are the skills and the practices and the management and the performance management and the careers that will make that uh, effective in the organization? Um, and that is really what HR is designed to do. Now, we have sort of designed the HR function in these functional silos. We have a recruiting department, we have a employee engagement department, we have a compensation and benefits department, uh, we have a department that does compliance. Those are all important practices of HR, but we shouldn't just focus on them as processes. The real process of HR is facilitating the productivity of employees. And those practices have to be really our tools that we use, but just setting ourselves up as functions and saying, well, we're going to just recruit, you know, whatever the managers tell us. That's not going to add as much value as it has in the past because the work is changing so dynamically. So, so uh, a lot more thinking about um, re-engineering what's going on in the company and a lot less about just doing the HR transactions, you know, the way they've always been done before. It's really sort of a sort of a fascinating and maybe sort of an unhappy problem that we have all this stress at work now, despite the fact that we have all this technology. Um, I, I think the you know if I think back about my career, uh, you know in the 70s and the 1980s, work was simpler. We didn't have so many distractions, and so the job of a manager was, you know, to sort of arrange the team and make sure people were working on the right things and give you a little bit of coaching and give you some feedback and, and just, you know, sort of make the work clear. Now I really think you as a manager need to really watch out and make sure the environment is not harmful to people. Um, don't have too many meetings. Don't have a do too many conference calls. Don't ask people to do too many things. Don't send too many emails. Um, listen to people. 
Spend time with people. See what their work day is really like. Understand what the stress of their job is like for them. Because you're not in that job, you may not know it. Uh, we have to be a lot more sensitive to that. And so I think, to some degree, managers have to be better trained to be facilitators, to be coaches, to, you know, I mean, I'm not saying managers have to be psychologists, but, but to really listen well. And that might mean that we need different people in management. I mean, this idea of a growth mindset, for example, is a very popular concept um, that we're all able to grow in our jobs. And if the leader believes that and understands that and supports that, we will all be more effective at work and the workplace will be a better place. That's a different type of manager than the manager in the 60s and 1970s that kind of told people what to do and set the goals and then went back in their office and shut the door. I mean, that, that literally is the way it used to be. Um, so, so I think we have to uh, reassess what the job of a manager is. And in some cases, the manager is only a coach and your actual project manager is somebody else. And you might have a, we call him a career advisor or a career counselor in Deloitte, but you might have somebody who's more like a sponsor who's helping you get your career managed and, and improve your work performance. And then there's a project leader that you're actually working for on the work itself, who might be a sales manager or somebody else. So I think we have to really do some thinking about what the role of management is in this work environment. And then um, from the standpoint of the HR function, um, we need to have a program of some kind that looks at human performance. Um, more and more companies are telling me well-being, wellness, mental health, uh, mindfulness, yoga, exercise, diet, sleep. These are all things that are people, the problems that people are bringing into the workplace that they want help with because work is so relentless in a sense. And so those are things that, that I think the HR function has to spend some time on in a programmatic way. I wish we didn't call it AI. Just call it software. It's just more intelligent software. And, and you know, for years, tools and software has been getting smarter. I mean, if you go back and you look at the tools we used, the technology tools we used in the 1970s and the 1980s, they were pretty dumb compared to today. Um, even word processors, you know, the idea of self-correcting word processors. I'm sure somebody was worried about the self-correcting computer that, you know, we would put out of business the editor who used to correct spelling errors. Well, that didn't happen. That editor's doing something else. So we don't have to be worried about AI. I, I think what we really have to do in HR is actually get to know what it does so we can understand how jobs are changing. And in every given f field of work, whether it be, you know, a healthcare professional in a hospital or a salesperson selling a product of some kind, you know, how are these tools going to change the work that people do and what do we have to do to the organization, to the team, to the measurement, to the performance management to adapt to that. I think actually HR professionals are going to be tremendous benefactors of AI because we will be getting better data, better insights, better information about how people are performing at work than we ever have before. Individuals will be getting suggestions and nudges and tips from these tools that will be better and more interesting, um, just like it's going on in the, in the consumer internet. So, so I, I don't think it's anything to be afraid of at all. There isn't a business leader anywhere that isn't trying to figure out how to better take advantage of technology right now, whether it is digitizing something, putting something on mobile, creating more integrated experience for customers, uh, you know, changing the nature of the way the user interface works. I mean, we're all dealing with those kinds of things in virtually every company. Um, but I think the more, and, and so those are clearly problems, but I think the more interesting problem is how do you organize your people to develop and facilitate the use of those tools? So the idea, for example, of an agile business team and having DevOps, what's now called DevOps, which is an operations group to service you know, the technology and service the customers behind the technology. Uh, that didn't exist five years ago. No one really was thinking about it. So understanding what Agile means and how to operate in an Agile way. I was talking to a company yesterday that took their whole L&D department and turned it into Agile. So now their L&D department is doing iterative design every day. They're doing stand-up meetings every morning. They're having sprints just like software engineering people do. 
So some of the principles, the management principles that have been developed in the digital development domain are coming into the HR domain. Experiments, doing A-B testing, um, understanding user journeys, employee journeys. Those are all concepts that some sort of came out of the software industry that, that we're now adopting in HR. So business leaders uh, have to be aware of all of this, and most of them are, um, and be comfortable you know, adapting to these new business practices and these new ways of, of organizing people. I don't know why people are afraid of software. <laughs> um, software is a tool, um, and even though we have robots and all these funny AI movies and things that you're seeing, most of the time when you're using AI, you don't even know you have it. Like I have a car that has AI-assisted driving. You know, if I drive over a white line, it turns back to the left. If I get too close to the car in front of me, it beeps. If a pedestrian walks in front of the road, it actually slows down. The car is doing all this stuff for me. It's great. I, I love it. I, mean, I have no problem with it whatsoever. It doesn't bother me that it's going to take over my job as a driver. It just makes it a little bit easier for me. Most of the tools that are being developed are augmented, are augmenting work. They're improving safety. They're making it easier to find information. They're giving us better tips as individuals or as teams. Um, they're giving us more insights into what's going on in a customer situation. Um, so I, I don't think we should be talking about AI in terms of replacing work anymore. I think we're past that. We're, we're now talking about AI as augmenting work. The thing that I think HR people really do need to think about is are you doing things that are making people more productive and making it easier for them to do their jobs. And if you're not, why are you doing the things you're doing? Now there are compliance things and there are process things and there's you know sort of data management things that have to happen in HR. But if you're not spending 75% of your time trying to figure out how to improve somebody's skills, get somebody better aligned, help somebody be a better leader, um, make the organization or culture clearer and more useful to people, communicate to people better what's going on in the company, then you're not spending your time on the right things. And it's easy to get, track, get bogged down in processes and procedures and forms and we have to do, and that's great, but a lot of that stuff is getting automated. And you have to be okay letting go of that and focusing on the area where you're gonna add the most value. The other thing I would add is that, you know, at least for the current year, we're in a very big economic boom. So your candidate experience, your employment brand, your employee experience, your ability to source people is going to be a really competitive advantage. If you can't get the right people to come work for your company in this job environment, they're gonna go somewhere else. So spending time on on really the talent brand and the talent attraction and the recruiting function is another very strategic part of HR. And then the other one that I've been talking about for years is learning. Um, the learning and development profession has had a tough time um, as the, the content all went online and we didn't have tools to manage it. Now we have some incredibly new, really powerful micro learning tools and curation tools for learning that that are available, that are in production, that HR people can buy. So that's another area of very high value in 2018 that I really think people should spend time.